Hello and welcome to the Sprinkler Coffee Club. I'm Marshall Kirkpatrick, and I sure appreciate you joining us today for the Sprinkler Coffee Club. You don't have to drink coffee to join us here in the Sprinkler Coffee Club, but I recommend it. I think that uh, it's going to be an exciting show today with our very special guest, Scott Monty. Scott, thanks so much for joining us. My great pleasure, Marshall. Joining you for some coffee here in my personalized Twitter mug. Oh, fantastic. Folks, I am so excited that we got Scott on as a guest. Scott and I have uh, been, been online friends for a long time, and we've been able to make the jump into uh, a direct personal relationship uh, through a, a number of different collaborations. And uh, it's really a blessing for me, and I think uh, for all of us, we're able to join today. Uh, you are probably familiar with Scott's work uh, over the past decade plus. Uh, Scott is most famous for bringing digital and social communication to the venerable Ford Motor Company. Uh, but since that time, Scott has done even more interesting work in my book. I love describing the work that Scott does today. He is a, an executive consultant and advisor specifically focused on bringing timeless wisdom from classic literature to bear on contemporary, if not cutting edge, communication, marketing, and technology challenges. Scott, how does that sound as a, a description for what you're up to these days? My goodness, Marshall, that sounds really impressive. Um, I, I think I'm going to patent that. Yeah, it's fantastic. I love Scott's blog. I love Scott's tweets. Uh, he's really good at uh, Twittering uh, original thoughts as well as content curation. Uh, I know you've got a, a tweet chat coming up all about your uh, your Twitter curation, for example. Don't you, Scott? Uh, actually, that just happened uh, earlier this week with uh, the Content Marketing World folks. Uh, you know, that's kind of a preview of the talk I'm giving there in Cleveland in September. Uh, and, and, you know, content curation, I think these days, more than ever, is an extremely important part of uh, not only how I do business, but I think how a lot of brands need to think about what it is that they're presenting to their audiences. That's fantastic. Good. Well, we love those folks over at CMI. And content curation is a really important part of uh, what we do here at, at Sprinkler as well. But in most cases, when we think about uh, content curation, we have a really contemporary focus, but that is not the only option available to us. And Scott exemplifies a, a real wisdom in stretching back throughout time to, to find great content throughout history and bringing it up into the present and, uh, and carrying its wisdom with it. I hope that you will join us today in the conversation feel free to post your comments or questions in comments here on YouTube. We'll pick that up and uh, we will do our best to incorporate your questions into our conversation with Scott. Scott, there are so many things that we could talk about today, but I am really excited to begin with the topic of emotional intelligence, particularly in the field of leadership in this incredibly dynamic time that we, we find ourselves in. I know that's something you've been writing a lot about lately. Can you tell us a, a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, Marshall, I didn't set out to start writing about emotional intelligence. It, it's something that's just kind of happened upon me. Um, in, in looking at some of the attributes that I admired most from the leadership at Ford Motor Company, particularly Alan Mulally, who was the CEO uh, during my tenure there. Um, it, it's really about setting a culture for an organization. And as you and I have talked before, and as I've written about for Sprinkler, uh, culture, I think, is an extremely important part of transformation, whether it's digital transformation or operational transformation or what have you. Um, it's not going to stick. It's not going to take root unless you've actually set the culture out that undergirds the strategy, which then undergirds the, uh, you know, the, the execution of whatever it is you're putting in place, whether it's a set of tools or processes or teams. 
and and uh, you know the old management uh, trope that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. It's absolutely true. You know that the best planned strategy doesn't stand a chance of surviving if you haven't established a culture to make it possible to exist and thrive in the first place. Right. So in thinking about that and thinking about these impacts to culture, about leaders I admire, um, you know, I do a lot of reading. I, I, I read, uh, you know, modern business books. I read I go back and I read the classics. You know, I was a classics major as an undergrad uh, looking at a lot of the ancients. Um, but I also appreciate just literature from all ages. So I try to find my inspiration, as I think all marketers should, from everywhere. You know, I, 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 I take it all in and I process it and then I kind of regurgitate it, and hopefully in a way that makes sense to people. And I found over time that I kept drawing these parallels between what's going on right now. And, and I don't care what the platform is, what the technology is, but the human behaviors that are centered around what's going on now and how I could find examples of this happening before in history or in literature or even expressed through certain aspects of poetry. And I thought, wow, you know, it, you, you talked about curation, you know, and we spend so much time curating, uh, you know, last week's news articles about uh, the digital ecosystem. Well, that's great because there's so much out there for us to, to grapple with. But what about putting that in context? What about curating the works from not only last week and last year, but last century or the last millennium, right? And, and pulling out those nuggets that are still relevant today, curating that and putting a spin on it so that it, it makes sense to people and that it's relevant. Right. And mm -hmm. I, in, in doing so, I've seen a lot of leaders come forward and, you know, just the light bulb goes off over their head and they think, wow, uh, you know, if, if I can understand the core at this, if I can understand the fundamentals that are making my people tick, uh, then it's not going to be as transactional what I'm trying to accomplish. It's going to be more transformational. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. It, it brings to mind something that the analyst firm Forrester has been writing lately about this model they've got uh, around uh, hygiene tasks and differentiation tasks for marketers. And for so many of us, I think, engaging in contemporary discourse and sharing articles from our peers and putting uh, our two cents and our spin on it is uh, an essential form of of marketing hygiene, of mm -hmm. being present and engaged and trying to add value. But the way that you have gone back and pulled from a much deeper trove of content has turned that curation into a real differentiator for you. I, I, I can't see anybody else doing this uh, right now. I mean, you, you look at, well, let, let me step back for a moment. Um, one of the inspirations I had for this is a woman by the name of Maria Popova, and she has a site called Brain Pickings, and she has, I think, one of the most amazing intellectual minds out there and goes through, again, the, the, the history of literature, philosophy, you know, poetry, you name it, and, and brings these things to light. Now, hers isn't meant with a with kind of a leadership and a management perspective. I think hers is meant just more for intellectual stimulation and reflection, which is that's important as well. Mine comes with more of a, um, let's say, a pragmatic business application. Uh, you know, the principles of leadership, the principles of management as found in, you know, uh, the, the pages of history. Well, I love that the first source cited. First cited here is brain pickings and uh, and a female curator. Let's go back further into history, uh, though I read it just last week, I believe, in a blog post of yours, and and discuss perhaps one of, if not the most cited thinkers in in history, that being Confucius. So I, I love the Confucius quote that you brought to bear here on a discussion of emotional intelligence and in particular reflection and leadership. I, the uh, Confucius quote that you cited read, learning without reflection is a waste. Reflection without learning is dangerous. 
Learning without reflection is a waste and reflection without learning is dangerous. Why did you cite that, Scott? What does that mean to you? Well, it was one of these quotes that, you know, I wasn't seeking out. I just came across it and I thought about it for a little bit. And I thought, hmm, I mean, certainly as with all of Confucius, um, there's there's great truth there, you know, great wisdom. And, you know, what, what is such a, a short and powerful set of phrases? Um, but I thought, well, how does this apply to what we think about today? And And, you know, the digital space allows us to become so disconnected from ourselves and from each other uh, that it doesn't leave a lot of space for reflection. And I believe that any good leader uh, spends a good amount of time each day reflecting on conversations they had, decisions they made, information that was presented to them in order to process it and make sense out of it. Now, it could mean that you go back tomorrow and you follow up that conversation with a colleague or a subordinate and, and you try to improve on something that you weren't satisfied with. Or, you know, the next time around you have an interaction like that, it's in your mind, so you, you act a little bit differently. Um, or you, you take the information that was provided to you and put it through whatever kind of uh, lens or model, a mental model that makes sense to you. Uh, and 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 then make a decision on it. Uh, you know, reflection is incredibly important. And and I'll tell you, I uh, one of the leaders I do a lot of reading about, uh, particularly with respect to emotional intelligence, is Abraham Lincoln. And in that, uh, you'll notice in that same blog post, I actually led with an image of Lincoln uh, and the flag. And here's the thing with Lincoln, um, a, a great scholar. Even though he was self-taught, you know, bought a bought a barrel from an estate sale uh, that was filled with books, and he educated himself, and he used those learnings, and he stayed up late past all past uh, the bedtime of all his other uh, fellow lawyers and then representatives later on to learn things and to read things and improve himself, and his ability to reflect and to pull back on the things he learned, to hear what people said to him, to be respectful of them. And to give them, to, to give pause to any kind of knee-jerk reaction that he might have had, he was a consummate letter writer. Well, writer in general, but a, he was a letter writer. When something that someone said bothered him, or when he had that instinct to have that emotional response, he would jot a letter down to the person in question. And he would get all of his anger, all of his emotions out. And then he'd take that letter and he'd put it in a drawer and he'd never send it because he knew that in sending the letter, that would do more damage to the relationship or to the situation than not sending it. And writing the letter served its purpose. It allowed him to emote, allowed him to express those feelings. And today, mm -hmm. what's the first thing, you know, if somebody gets angry on Twitter, the first thing is somebody hits back. Um, and, and I don't care if it's your, the troll from the basement or the president of the United States. You know, you see this kind of, you know, instinct to hit back when we could all do with a little more reflecting uh, and, mm -hmm. and a little more learning from what we reflect on and acting accordingly. And I struggle with this every single day, Marshall. I, I try to be as optimistic and as um, respectful and, and as um, embracing as possible of, of alternate views. And, and I try to take the, the, the positive side. It's so easy to get sucked into that back and forth that social media allows us to do it really is. And I, I'm just keeping that in the back of my mind and trying, striving every day to try and be better about that as, as a, an individual and as a leader. Mm -hmm. I know when I read that blog post of yours, Scott, I stopped and and I thought this is one of I, I read three or four of your blog posts in a row and I had been reading a number of things prior that day and I said wait a second all of this learning is great but I need to set aside some time to stop and really reflect on what I just read and how I can apply that with my team at work and as I reflect further, then there will be opportunities. It'll be essential for me to learn more on an ongoing basis. But unless I stop 
and take some time to reflect on what I've learned. And unless I maintain that symbiotic relationship between learning and reflection, I won't be able to be a, a better leader all the time. So I thank you for that. That's no, that's that's a great point. There, there was another post I did about uh, the the concept of serenity, which you know kind of goes hand in hand with uh, reflection. If you don't have tranquil and serene times, you're you're going to have a hard time reflecting. Um, and and the idea was that serenity is probably one of the greatest virtues in life. And um, and to be tranquil, I wrote, is to be able to sit quietly and enjoy today without a nod toward the past or a glance toward the future, you know? And I, I, I think we need more of that, just being in the present and, and processing some of this stuff. And yeah, it sounds a little new agey, maybe it sounds a little uh, like meditation or mindfulness as you hear a lot in the workplace. Um, I think those phrases or those descriptions kind of devalue the, the deeper thinking and uh, processing that we need to do. Perhaps we can think of it as being Lincoln-like if uh, new aginess makes you uncomfortable. Speaking of adopting those types of behaviors in the workplace, we've got a question from a viewer. Our viewer, Davin, would like to know uh, what your thoughts are on mandatory emotional intelligence training in the workplace. That's really interesting. Um... It, it's one of these things like um, like sincerity, you know? Um, people say in order to succeed, you need to be more sincere. And once you can fake that, you'll, you'll really have it mastered. Um, <clears throat> to a certain extent, I think there's, there's an inherent set of traits that go with emotional intelligence um, that, that, you know, you kind of get with, you, you get what you're packaged with but at the same time, I think learning about emotional intelligence, learning about what these attributes are, um, I, I think everybody needs to understand that. Because it, to, to take emotional intelligence and throw the phrase around, just like to throw the phrase around mindfulness, um, it becomes meaningless after a while. Uh, and it, it's funny, in, uh, in Doris Kearns Goodwin's book, uh, which is all about, uh, it's, it's called Leadership in Turbulent Times. Right? It's, it's about... Theodore and Franklin Roosevelt and Abraham Lincoln and uh, LBJ, uh, all leaders that were faced with many crises in their own lives. And uh, what, one thing really uh, grasped me about Lincoln and she summed up in just one sentence. Uh, she said, Lincoln's emotional intelligence uh, was his empathy, humility, consistency, self-awareness, self-discipline, and generosity of spirit, right? Six things right there. And that, that's a whole blog post right there. I mean, that, that could be a keynote presentation um, or, or a set of courses at, uh, you know, your, your, your in-service training. Um, okay, yeah, we know about humility, but what does it really mean to, to be humble and to humble ourselves in front of our coworkers or in front of our, uh, our peers and, uh, and even our subordinates? Um, and until you've worked with an emotionally intelligent leader, it's really difficult to see those things in action uh, if, if you just see them on a piece of paper. So I think it's it's helpful to have this kind of training and, and discussion point around it. Whether or not somebody walks away being emotionally intelligent is another thing, because I think this is a it, it's a practice of life. It's something you need to work on over the course of your career. Is there a tension, Scott, or how do you see people succeed in wrestling with the tension between ambition and successfulness and the perhaps even supersized vision of what's possible that drives so much of the, the grind required to, to build corporate success uh, on one hand, and that kind of humility and emotional intelligence on the other hand. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it can best be expressed through the, the term of servant leadership. Uh, I think any good leader understands that they are acting in service to an organization, uh, whether it's in service to uh, the customer, the board of directors, um, you know, the suppliers, the franchisees, what have you. Um, 
no single person, even the CEO, is uh, a, a single point of power. They're in service to someone else or to something else. And ambition, yeah, that, that drives a lot of people. But if you're ambitious to the point of knocking down your, uh, your coworkers on your way to uh, seize the trophy uh, versus, um, you know, maybe having been responsible for a major win for your department, your team or your company and sharing in the glory with everyone, acknowledging the people that made it possible to get to where you went. Um, you know, I, I have been credited with a lot of stuff uh, with regard to digital and social at Ford Motor Company, and there's no way I could have done all of that myself. Uh, it, it, it would have been nigh impossible. It was because I had a great agency. It's because I had good leadership. It's because uh, the company supported it. It's because the customers were there. Um, you know, nobody in this world accomplishes something massive and on a massive scale by themselves. It takes a neighborhood, one might say. Yeah, there you go. And and that's something I want. <laughs> that's something I, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts about as well. I know you are really excited about the new Mr. Rogers movie coming out. I I am, and it's partially because I really enjoy uh, one of the subjects of the film. Now, this is not a biopic about Mr. Rogers. Uh, who, by the way, is played by Tom Hanks in this version. You know, there was a documentary that came out about Mr. Rogers, uh, which was really about his life and his work. Um, this one is about the relationship that he and the journalist Tom Junod um, had together. Tom uh, was a writer for GQ and Esquire, and I came upon his writing in 1996 when I read a, a long-form article um, about his father. Uh, he wrote, uh, you know, what I learned from my father, one of these Father's Day edition things, but his dad taught him about all kinds of things from grooming to uh, apparel to, you know, how you take a meeting and how you conduct yourself uh, in a uh, mixed company and things like that. It was just a wonderful uh, article. And, and you could tell by the end of it how well Tom respected his father, flaws and all. Well, Tom in 1998 was doing a, um, uh, a, a an article, long form article for Esquire on heroes. And he picked Mr. Rogers as his primary source. And it's in a blog post that I that I uh, put together is that the cover of Esquire that says, can you say hero? Now, most people wouldn't think of Mr. Rogers when they think of heroes. They think of strong men with capes and, you know, bulging muscles. And here's Mr. Rogers, a very timid fellow who sounds like an adult to children, but sounds like a child to adults. Um, and there's the magic right there. He's able to speak a language that is universal and that goes to everyone. And, and, and you know, I've been talking about optimism and positivity and respect and generosity. These are all things that exude from Mr. Rogers. And I think now we're, we're having kind of a Mr. Rogers uh, renaissance, if you will. So much of what he said when we were children is just as relevant today. Um, you know, another, another book I like to keep close by is uh, this simple book, The World According to Mr. Rogers. And just little anecdotes and sayings and whatnot to help keep the bigger picture in perspective. That's beautiful. So in the promotion for this show, I mentioned a really inspiring to me Forrester report that came out last week about the, the growing importance of what we've traditionally called soft skills, mm. uh, collaboration and empathy and creativity and critical thinking. Uh, so I can only imagine that as we say, move over Game of Thrones, here comes Mr. Rogers into the uh, contemporary culture, that there's a lot of opportunity there for us to use that symbol to discuss the changes that, that the business world could really benefit from and that we could learn from to be more successful in the changing business environment. Yeah, I, I absolutely think so, because at, at the same time that this is going on, we've also seen over the last couple of years or so more discussion around artificial intelligence and all the jobs that are going away. And when you think about all the hard skills 
uh, the engineering, the programming. Those are things, quite frankly, that machines can be taught to do and can be taught to do pretty efficiently and uh, pretty much error free. The soft skills that you just mentioned, you know, I'd really like to see a machine try its hand at empathy. I mean, I'm sure we're getting there, but it won't have the same kind of heartfelt approach. It'll be a machine processed approach to empathy. It'll be formulaic, not empathetic. And I think that's where these soft skills, the people that know those are actually going to come out ahead in this uh, kind of transformation, this technological transformation that's going on because we need more people like that. You know, would we be in a situation like we're in now with Facebook, for example, if they were less engineering driven and perhaps more humanities driven? Mm -hmm. So much opportunity there. Scott, I want to I want to ask you for some other quick examples here. We've got uh, a last question in from uh, from a viewer. Our viewer Dossel wants to know if you have any specific examples uh, of things you've seen work really well to accelerate that kind of cultural change or transformation towards an embrace of soft skills and embrace of collaboration. Yeah. Um, so, so here's here's uh, an example. Um, I think companies that have transformed from knowledge hoarding to knowledge sharing, right, that have been more transparent internally and in exchange externally as well, you know, that have brought customers on the journey with them, um, have seen more success. They've, they've been able to create a culture where people are not afraid to make mistakes, where they're not penalized for mistakes, where they learn quickly from those and they put them to use, where someone is unafraid to show up to a, a big departmental meeting or maybe a cross company meeting. And when everyone's reviewing their plans and everything's supposed to be going hunky dory, right? The person raises their hand and says, actually, I've got a big problem here. If you've established a culture where it's okay to stick your neck out, right? That's gonna happen. And consecutively what you'll see happen or consequently, what you'll see happen is other people around that table will raise their hands and say, hey, have you thought about this? Oh, we ran into this situation last quarter and here's how we solved it, right? You will see people contributing rather than pulling back when you've got this idea of knowledge sharing versus knowledge hoarding, right? So that sort of optimism and willingness to forgive and respect uh, is going to drive that cultural change to make that transformation possible. Fantastic. Fantastic. That makes me want to stick my neck out and help build that culture wherever I go. I appreciate your sticking your neck out today, Scott, and coming on here to talk about uh, these emerging thoughts and trends that are so important out for the rest of the world. I, I want to thank everybody who has tuned in today and ask questions live on the show. Uh, I hope that you will come back next week and join us with analyst Esteban Kolsky, who will be talking about uh, some of the deep trends and cutting edge opportunities in customer experience management. Esteban is another deep thinker and a real inspiring guy. But wow, today, Scott, we've talked about the power of reflection, We've talked about soft skills. We've talked about the importance of building a, a culture where you can stick your neck out. And that's really a lot to think about. So thank you so much. Uh, I hope everyone will check out Scott's work. Uh, you can find him online at, at Scott Monty on Twitter. You can find him at scottmonty.com on the web. Uh, I have had the pleasure to connect with Scott uh, with some of the biggest companies in the world and his advice is top shelf stuff. So uh, we are really appreciative of your joining us today, Scott. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marshall. All right, everyone, please do, uh, while you're here on YouTube, like and subscribe uh, to the Sprinkler YouTube channel so you can get notifications of future coffee clubs. We'd love to have you back as this show grows and evolves. Hope to have you back too, Scott, uh, but we sure are thankful that you're, you're part of the, the community here. And thanks again.